The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. I'm telling you something. When I was a young Christian, I had only two times in my life I had Scripture supernaturally lift off the page. And it's happening now. It's happening now. It was a living Bible. Isn't it amazing God could lift a Scripture off of a paraphrase? <laughs> he can use anything He wants, right? But it was a paraphrased translation. It was, a, I think, a living Bible, I think the classic edition. And I was sitting and I was grieved at how intelligent people could go off into cults. And I, I just couldn't understand it. And the one that was specifically grieved me was, it was in a magazine about UFO children going out to the Arizona desert to get in a spaceship to go to the Father's kingdom. And I, I was so nauseous and grieved in my spirit that I felt almost like, almost like th throwing up. It was so horrible. And I'm going, how, God? How could they be so deceived? How can people be so easily deceived? And that's when a scripture, I had a uh, living Bible there open. Actually, I put living Bibles in my parents' house, and I was at their house. Nobody was home. And I just sat down there, and I saw that magazine about UFO children, and, and I opened the Bible, and the letters came up in the air off the page. And I'll tell you, I read it with my mind, because it was written in English, obviously. But I'll tell you what, my spirit read it, and it was written on the tablet of my heart. And the exciting thing about it is this, this is that day now. It is happening. Just like there are tremors before an earthquake, right? The salvation of the Jews in Israel is the, is the beginning tremors of what is about to take place. And here is the scripture verse that came off the page. It was Hosea. Chapter 3, verse 5. I'm going, why God? Why God? Why are these people so goofy, really? Why, why are they so easily intelligent people? Because, I mean, there was professors and doctors going to the Arizona desert to get on a spaceship. I just, I couldn't get my head around it. How deception works, though. It is a veil, and it's, it blinds people. It's a spirit. It has nothing to do with your intelligence. It has to do with a corporate stronghold. But here's the scripture, Hosea 3, 5. In the air, it read to me to comfort me. Afterwards, after what? After they've done all their foolishness. After they've gone astray. After they've been deceived. Afterwards, they shall return to the Lord their God and the Messiah their King. And they shall come trembling and submissive to the Messiah in the end times. Huh? Afterwards, after all the nonsense, after they've tried everything that didn't work, afterwards they shall return to the Lord their God and to the Messiah their King. But listen to this, and they shall come trembling and submissive to the Lord and His goodness. So there is the key word here, and, and, and uh, Sid shared this in, in the Israel trip, that when they op lifted up their hands to be filled with the Holy Spirit, many were seen trembling. And that is the word of the Lord that God gave me, that that is a sign and a wonder. It's not just a, a, a physical uh, manifestation. By the way, a physical manifestation, I don't know about you, but if I'm impacted by my spirit, I want my spirit, soul, and my body impacted by the spirit of God. It's not about the trembling. 
It's about the fact that what started that trembling, it's a tremor before the big quake. It's the tremor before the outpouring. It's the little, little, the little taste of drawing you back. Return to me and I will return to you, saith the Lord. And I'll tell you what, God basically started using that word tremble. And the word of the Lord for today is tremble, that we need again to have cultivated in our heart. Who is this that trembles at my word? I'll tell you what, we need to return that. God was opening up Malachi to me this week. And, you know, I kind of just kind of bottom line Malachi as, well, you know, the people were cursed with a curse. They weren't blessed because they, they withheld the tithes and the offerings. You rob God. When you hold back the tithes and the offerings, you rob God. But God said, take a look again. And I started looking again, and it wasn't that simple. It wasn't that they kept the tithes. They were actually offering the sick, the blind, and the lame. They were giving what they didn't want, and they were given with a stinky attitude. And I began to see there was no trembling there. They were just grudgingly giving. And that God was saying, what I'm zeroing in here is the attitude determines your performance. How many tremble at my word? That's what's missing. And I looked again, and I said, guess what? Those people he was rebuking, they're... They, they said what a lot of Christians would say. What, what, where have I robbed you? I've been doing it. Yeah, but I see your heart. Where's the sensitivity? Where's the proper attitude? You know, in the New Testament, it says God loves a cheerful giver. God dealt with me in, in the very beginning. And I was in deep, deep poverty. And God lifted me out of it by doing all the things that he told me to do that didn't make a lot of sense. Like taking a job that's less than welfare. Like doing stuff like that. And cleaning toilets with a college education, cleaning toilets and mopping floors. And God basically just blessed me from that time on. But he said, you know what, Dennis? Yeah, you tithe. That's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for a generous attitude that is maintained 24-7. It's one thing to, to give your tithes and your offerings, but it's a whole other thing to be a generous person because that's cultivated out of the character. That has to become an attitude. So God basically is saying, I'm going to get the church to tremble. That that foretaste of what, what Sid saw in Israel, where they began to tremble, holding their hands up to the Lord, that is a minor tr tremor compared to about what is to take place. There's going to be a release that's going to be a suddenly, and that suddenly is going to cause people to tremble again at the word. He said, return to me. That's what he said in Malachi. Return to me. You're going through the motions. You're offering me. You're sick. You're blind. You're lame. Yeah, you're tithing in your own mind, but I'm looking at your heart, and I'm saying your attitude is wrong. You don't, where is my honor? There's no honor in your attitude. You're going through the motions, but there's no honor. Where is my honor, says the Lord? Where are you honoring me? Because man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart, and God will deal with the heart. I'll tell you what, you know, this is what's going to change in the days ahead. We are spiritual beings in human experience. Not we are human beings trying to get a spiritual experience. You've got to settle for a fact that your new identity as a new creation is something that is your primary identity in living in a human lifestyle. We are citizens of another kingdom and we're on earth to reveal that kingdom. I'll tell you what, Isaiah, Isaiah 66, 12, for all those things my hands have made, and those things exist, says the Lord, but on this is the one that I'm going to look. Listen, people, because this is where he's looking. He's looking on your heart. He's not looking at your exterior behavior as a, as a sign or a wonder. He's looking at the internal heart attitude. And he says, these are the ones that I'm going to look upon. One who is poor and of a contrite spirit who trembles at my word. Trembling at his word, that word trembling, what did the scripture that came off the page? And God says, is happening now? Afterwards, they shall return to the Lord their God. What was Malachi saying? You're going through the motions, religious people, but you need to return to me. You return to me and I'll open up the heavens. I'll pour out such a blessing you can't contain it. But first there's a returning. 
And don't do what they did and say, what, what, where do I need to return? I'm doing all the right stuff. Well, mostly. I think there's even something where he said, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. They may have been going through the motions, but I also believe, this is just my opinion, they're holding back too. Because of an, what? An attitude. Attitude determines performance. An attitude needs to be, have this attitude that was in Christ Jesus. When you have that attitude, you're operating in a proper character, motive. You're operating in the love of God. Now listen to this. Hosea 3, 5. Afterwards, they shall return to the Lord their God and the Messiah their King. And they shall come, how? Trembling. That's a good attitude, isn't it? This is the one I'm going to look at, the one who has a contrite heart and trembles at my word. They're going to return to the Lord their God. And look at the tremble in the, in the proper respect, too. This is not uh, demonic fear. This is honor. They shall return to me, and they shall come to me. In an attitude of trembling, and in that trembling or sensitivity, in that sensitivity, they're going to come to my goodness in the end times. I'll tell you what, this is the end times, and this is the time where you're seeing that happen. If ever there was a time to return in your heart, Returning to first love, you can call it whatever you want, but I'll tell you what, if you've been going through the motions and you feel like you're in pretty good shape, you need to get in a small group too. I think you might find out you're not as good a shape as you think you are. Huh? <laughs> you just might be aware that there's some issues in your life. But here's, here's what I'm seeing. On him who is of a poor and a contrite spirit, who trembles at my word, but they're going to come trembling, Hosea 3.5, they're going to come trembling and submissive to the Lord and to His goodness. I don't want to know about you, but I want to be under that spigot when the goodness gets poured out, don't you? But the primary thing here to change is my attitude. It's going to have to cultivate a generous attitude 24-7, not just giving your tithes and offerings. It's going to have to be a condition of the heart. It's going to be, have to be part of your nature to be generous. And I can remember when the Lord dealt with me on that, it, it was basically tithes. That was just an indication of your, your faith in, toward God that He was your supply. But the generosity took on all forms all week long. And to this day, that is meaningful to me. There's the time where you don't let your left hand know what your right hand's doing. That's the time when you are honor God who sees secretly what you do privately. But listen to this. Here's where we're in the training, and we need the how-tos to this. God's basically saying we're going to come submissive. People are going to come submissive. I see the equality of not only the Jews coming to Jesus and evangelizing the Gentiles, but I see men and women being restored back to the image of God's creation where he made them male and female and said, it is good. And it is not good for man to be alone. It is not for man to rule over woman. That's part of the fall. You have an equal place in the kingdom of God. And you will not project a, the face of God until they properly are given your proper place in the kingdom. That's going to happen. It's going to be God removed the dividing walls. The one new man is going to require men and women to function. I realized how rare it was when we traveled and went church to church, and some churches wouldn't have us because I had Jennifer. They didn't want women in the, behind the pulpit. And I told them, they, and they said, we'll take you, but not, not, not Jennifer. We can't have a woman preaching up there. And I said, well, God told me he wouldn't send me to anybody that... Uh, didn't want us, right? <laughs> if you don't want us, God is sending us to you anyway. So I'm, I'm, I'm going where God sends me. And apparently he's not sending me to you. <laughs> so, 
one new man breaks down the dividing walls. The wall of what? Hostility. Do you think there's some hostility toward women in the church? Yeah. yeah. That wall's got to come down because God's putting together one new man. And in 1989, I sat under a tree and God gave me a download of the strategy at the end times would be the strategy of Gideon. And you shall strike the enemy as one man. Yeah. Isn't that Judges 6.16? You shall strike the enemy as one man. That is Jew, Gentile coming together, but that's also man and woman. It's, it's a picture of the Godhead and a cleansing from the result of the fall. Man ruled over woman as a result of the fall. God came through Jesus, our Messiah, to bring back together that which was from the beginning, made in the image of God. Now, here's where we got to go with this trembling, because this, this word was so strong this morning that I was trying to make some notes, and my hands were shaking. And God's basically saying, this is a sign, and that's only the mild tremors before the great deluge of blessing that's coming upon the church. But I'll tell you what, if our part needs to be done, it's going to be this. Listen to this. Here, th these scriptures are going to come alive in the, in the decade ahead. In the decade ahead, you're going to hear scriptures that you knew were in your Bible, but they're going to come to the forefront. All of the peace scriptures are going to come to the forefront because that's going to be the power of God to crush the enemy beneath your feet, the God of peace. All of the scriptures on trembling and submissive, is going to come to the forefront because it's going to be redefined by the Spirit of God, not by man. Submissive, by the way, is an attitude of the heart. Here it is. This is taking place now. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12, it says, Therefore, my beloved... As you have always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. trembling. Has anyone ever asked, how do I do that? <laughs> how do I do that? Apparently, there's something on my part that has to be done. There's a requirement on my part to work out my salvation with fear and trembling. Afterwards, they shall return to the Lord their God and to the Messiah their King, and they shall come trembling and submissive to the Lord and His goodness. So there's our part, isn't it? We need to what? Respond. And, well, how do I work this out? Isn't it interesting that the very next verse gives the answer? For it is God who is at work in you to will and to perform. We've gone church to church teaching people how to experience that word rather than just quote it. We're better at quoting than we are living it. But this was meant to be a living word. Jesus is a living word and he wants to live his life through us. So, wait a minute now. You just got done telling me, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. I'm supposed to work this out. But then immediately after that, you say, for it is God who is at work to will and to perform it. Who's doing it? That's better. Christ in you. It has to be the new creation you. It has to be that part of you, the real you that is Joined together with him, they that are joined to the Lord are one spirit with him. If it does not come from the new creation, you, it's the flesh. The flesh isn't asked to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. When did salvation come? By grace through faith, it was the gift of God. You didn't do anything for it, did you? So now, having started in the spirit, don't you think we've got to continue in the spirit? Dead works are going to have to fall by the wayside because if you're going to work out your, 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 your salvation with fear and trembling, it's going to be, listen to this, and we've said it over and over, and you'll hear it over and over again because I found out that people need to hear some, some things 20 times before it takes. Here's what it's going to take in the decade ahead. I'm saying, I've given you 10 years on this. Hopefully some of you will get it in 10 weeks. 
All right? We live by dying. We fight by yielding. That's foreign element to many in the church. They fight by resisting with willpower. That doesn't work. You're going to crash and burn. Have you ever heard the term burnout with church people? Because they're not doing it right. It's impossible to burn out if it is God who is at work and you both the will and to perform. The problem is you want to do rather than yield. And some of those people, before they burn out, they talk about, I'm a doer of the word. If you were a doer of the word, you'd be co-laboring with the word. You wouldn't be trying to live the Christian life in your flesh. Working out your salvation with fear and trembling is sensitivity. Trembling is the sensitivity that, that this is the one that God, oh God look at, look at that Dennis and Jennifer right now. They're trembling at my word. They're, they're yielding and surrendering to me. Ah, I can quicken that. I can use that. I can will and perform through them, through that new creation. Them, And then it's God who is at work to will and to perform. Can you see the conflict between verse 12 and verse 13? Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, but to keep in mind, how did I get that salvation? By grace through faith, it was a gift. I didn't earn it by works. So having started that way in the spirit, why would I want to get into dead works? I'm telling you, Kingdom Life Church, you're going to move in a new dimension of the spirit, but you're going to realize that you live by dying. It's going to be a genuine work of the cross, and you're going to come to appreciate the fact that you take up your cross daily and die to yourself. And then you fight by yielding. I'll tell you what, you can be in a hostile environment, you yield to God, you will get the proper direction when to speak, when not to speak when to act and when not to act. Because people want canned answers all the time. Well, what do you do in this situation? Well, I'd say trust God because there's times he's told me to do one thing and there's times in that same situation he's told me to do something else. You know what? You, you're a derivative life. You are, a, you, you, you are not the source. God is the head of mankind. Man is the head of woman. Where did woman come from? Came from Adam? Adam's rib? Where'd man come from? God? Did God make man and woman? Sure did. And he made them in his image. And man by himself, this is not good, man by himself. He needs a, a partner that will complement him, not an opposite not a weaker person, not a slave or a maid. He made her a complement so that together they can be an expression of God. Now we're understanding scriptures God's given Jennifer and I through the years. The time that he came into our room when we were praying together and we, blurted, we were silently soaking in the presence of God and we both blurted out a scripture at the same time. He came in and we went by our perception. Yeah, that's a feeling, a spiritual perception. And the perception was we were knit together. And God, and I said, this is two or three gathered. Jennifer said, this is one accord. God is going to begin to bring male and female, Jew and Gentile, man and woman, and he's going to bring them together to be a more, a more expressive person of, the, of who God is to the church of Jesus. And the scripture he gave me years ago, that you hear it in every sermon, he who began a good work is going to continue it. You haven't seen anything yet. Nothing. You're going to have to take all of your good experiences and consider them rubbish. I'm talking good experiences. Consider them rubbish compared to the things that God has laid for you and I together. We're in a beautiful time. We live by dying and we fight by yielding. How many can repeat that already? We live by dying. We fight by yielding. All right, we'll see. That doesn't sound believable yet, but... All right. So... Here's the way God trained me in the school of the Spirit. He wasn't going to let me go to Bible school at that point in time. 
And so he trained me through Isaiah chapter 50. And here's the first thing. How do I tremble? How do I learn to do this tremble thing? How do, how do I tremble? Well, how do I cultivate that attitude? How do I work out my salvation? How is it do I get God who is at work in me to will and to perform? And there's five elements to cultivating that trembling attitude. Remember, it's an attitude. This is not blind obedience now. This is an attitude cultivation of God's character, His motive, which is love. First, the Lord gave me Isaiah 50, verse 4. The Lord God has given me the tongue of a disciple so that I would know how to speak a word in season to them that are weary. He awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to hear. And the first thing that God taught was promptness. Promptness. He said, I'm going to awaken you morning by morning. But that also means, Dennis, I don't want you talking in the beginning. You don't have anything to say until you've heard something. I want you, and Dennis is a talker, and I wanted to preach to God, but he told me to sit still and listen. I'm the instructor. You be the student. And just like a classroom, the student should listen to the instructor. It's not the instructor doesn't come there to hear everything the student has to say. So I got silent, and God taught me purpose number one was that I honored him by listening, cultivating an ear of a mystic. And I use the word mystic in the proper sense, the old biblical sense, not the new age sense. A mystic was one who had intimate relationship with God. Now, Prompt listening did one thing. God says, you know what I'm cultivating in you right now? While you shut up and listen instead of talking to me? <laughs> I'm cultivating honor. What did he do with all those sacrifices in Malachi? What did God say? Where is my honor? And God says, I'm going to teach you honor. Listen. Quiet yourself in my presence. Listen, not talk, listen. You don't have anything to say until you've heard something. <laughs> I honored him, and he showed me that you give power to what you give attention to. Now, I'm learning to obey, and I'm, this, this key here was what he was teaching me was obeying instantly. And he was showing me that if you give attention to something, you give power to it. This is for your Christians who get bummed out and have bad days. You should have bad minutes. You ought to grow up. Having bad days or bad weeks is a sign of rabid immaturity. And I know because I was rebuked for it. <laughs> and he basically says, Prompt obedience to the living word. This is the way you tremble. Not with your temper tantrum, trying to tell God how you feel. Not talking about what someone else did. How did you respond to what someone else did? That's the grown-up response. And quite frankly, in our house groups, that's all we need to hear. We don't need to hear about somebody else. We need to hear, how did you respond to that somebody else? Isn't that, isn't that true? You want to grow in the grace and in the knowledge of God, and then it's basically how do you respond with the Word of God and the Holy Spirit. That's what maturity is made of. Maturity is made out of how you learn to respond to the Word of God and the Holy Spirit. And God's basically saying, I'm going to teach you prompt obedience. None of this being bummed out for days and weeks at a time. Being bummed out, because here's what the Lord showed me with this point number one, which is how to obey instantly is how you're going to learn to tremble at my Word. How many want to obey instantly? All right, this is only one of five points to get you to grow up. And he's basically, and this is the school he sent me through to get me to grow up and quit doing this. Jennifer's lived with me 20 years. You don't see me bummed out for more than minutes. Do I sin? Of course I sin, just like you do too. 
But I'll tell you what, it doesn't last. The days of the temper tantrum and acting like a baby. You don't understand how bad I hurt me. He's the only one that can take my hurt and my pain. Go to him. And quit going to other people when you could be going to him. And he takes your pain and your sorrow. Those other people can't take it. As a matter of fact, many of them are wearied from trying to take your pain and your sorrow. <laughs> it's called dumping. But here's what the Lord was saying. Why I'm teaching you, Dennis, to obey instantly is because of the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus that sets us free. There's the law of sin and death. And you know what he showed me? I thought I was having a temper tantrum about how hurt I was to de declare to God just how bad it hurt. Probably when I was a little kid, probably got my mother's attention a lot like that. You know, at a temper tantrum. They, used to, they got pictures of me with my bottom lip out like this. <laughs> Pouting. All right. That was my way of retaliation. Or decreeing and declaring. Huh? Come on, church, you're good at decreeing and declaring. How about decreeing and declaring? You're bummed out. You're hurt. You got your, you, you got owies. Oh, this preacher's sensitive to people. I don't know if I'd ever want to talk to him about my problem. I'm going to point you to the answer. And then, but you don't, under, you don't understand how bad it hurts in here and how I've been hurt. No, no, unless you take that hurt to Jesus. Matter of fact, we even have a, in our training, we go, I don't know about that. Because people go off on tangents. They go into the blame game. It's always what someone else did to them. When in reality, it's basically how did you respond to them? How did you go to God? Did you yield and go to God? But you don't understand. I don't have to understand that. I don't know about that. We, we, we even trained our people to say, I don't know about that. Even if you know about it, you're not helping somebody, giving them an answer. You say, I don't know about that, but unless you take that pain to Jesus within, we're like sheepdogs trying to shepherd the sheep to the shepherd. Go to the one that can do something about it. And it's, you don't understand. I don't have to understand. But don't tell me. Don't, I've never heard anyone say, Jesus doesn't understand what I've been through. <laughs> yeah, pull that one on us sometime. All right? But can you see, to be serious, you want to tremble at his word, you'd have to start with obeying instantly. You know right from wrong. All of you know your Bible far too well to get into a mood. A mood is a disgraceful thing. A mood, you cannot physiologically maintain a particular emotion for a long period of time. You'll wear out. Whether it's happy, angry, you can only hold it so long. But a mood is like, is like a climactic or a climate condition that moves in and hovers over a long period of time. And a mood will change your brain. You don't need your brains changed. You need them renewed, <laughs> right? Okay. All right. I got to cover five of these and some more things here, so I'm going kind of slow here. But he showed me the law of increase and the law of sin and death. This broke me from those temper tantrums. He showed me that in the law of life, you sow a seed, you reap a harvest, right? You sow to the wind, you reap the whirlwind. He showed me that while I was having my temper tantrum, it was like there was this progressive scale that evil was getting stronger. And that, Dennis, you give power to what you give attention to. So you want to stay bummed out. You are opening the door to making it more powerful in your life. By the same token, prompt obedience you enter into the law of life faster, the law of life, God and his nature get stronger and stronger. That's how you work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Trembling is the sensitivity that I have an attitude that what you give attention to, what you focus on, you give power to. So it can be the law of life or the law of sin and death. But the longer you stay in it, the more powerful you make it and the more part of your life it is. And if it turns into a mood, it's changing your brain. You're being, you're being wired. 
for that attitude. All right? The second thing. That's the first way to learn to tremble at his word. Prompt obedience. The second way he taught me was to obey even if it doesn't make sense. Prompt obedience is good enough to work on, right? But obey when it doesn't make sense, that's when we kind of get in. I can't get my head around it. It isn't about you getting your head around it. It's about learning to let the peace of God rule that peace will not lie to you. Your head may not understand it. And I'll give you an example. Uh, a friend of mine, you know, Sandy, and, and another pastor worked with this guy. He was a financial disaster going somewhere to happen. He was always looking for a get-rich-quick, and we were concerned about him providing for his wife and kids. And he had these schemes. He always had a scheme, and it never worked. And he was always financially destitute. They basically passed them on to me because they said, we've done everything we know. And Sandy was a, a multi-million dollar businessman. And he says, I've taught him everything I know, he, but he doesn't, he's not teachable. You want to try? <laughs> and I worked with him. And again, God said, don't, whatever you do, don't give him money. He had a job where he worked in a place where he had access to a register to where you could take an advance on your paycheck put a little note, I took $40, pay, by payday, he was so bad with fine, by payday there never was a check. Because he took an advance on Tuesday, he took an advance on Wednesday, he took an advance on Thursday, Friday, payday, and he got paid weekly and could not, could not resist taking an advance. And it was without reason. Other people were primarily trying to feed the little girl to make sure she had food at least. But God said, do not give him money. Teach him the principles. And we worked with him, we worked with him, and I'm riding in the car with him one day, and all of a sudden the Lord says, empty your wallet. Now, does that make sense? And give it to him. Does that make sense? After all we were through, after all the instruction, after all I knew up here, after all of what others did, this is a case where God taught me, obey even if it doesn't make sense. I obeyed, I don't think I had that much in my wallet, <laughs> but I emptied the wallet and I gave it to him. And when I gave it to him, he burst out crying. That day, he decided against his addiction, he stood in front of that open cash register drawer and he must have stared, he said, for a half an hour and I refused to take an advance. I was going to try to trust God. Wow. Obey when it doesn't make sense. That changed his life for the better. But if I went by my reasoning mind, God, you already said, whatever you do, don't give him money. You know, giving money to people that are irresponsible is not necessarily the Christian thing to do. The Christian thing to do is to teach them how to stand on their own two feet. And would you know the difference? Could you bypass that mind of yours and obey? So I want to make sure I cover these five areas to learn to tremble at his word. One, Obey instantly. Practice that until it is instant. Your life will go well. Instantly with a proper attitude. What it would be the proper attitude to obey instantly? Grudgingly? Honor. Obey, which brings us to the third one, even when it hurts. <laughs> You know what? There might have been a little bit of hurt, even though God said, empty your wallet. I think maybe the first feeling that I went was obedience, and I did it. But it probably was a little ache in here, going, oh, this is empty now. <laughs> huh? You think that could have entered in? 
but you obeyed, and it transformed a life. Obey even if it hurts. Do you know that Jesus, though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things that he suffered? Isn't that interesting? That coming in the form of man, he learned obedience by the things that he suffered. Nevertheless, not my will, God, but thy will be done. I delight to do thy will, O God. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish. Is that a good attitude? Would that have honor in it, in the obedience? Would that have honor in it? I delight to do your will, O God. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish the course. I th- it sounds like he's honoring his father to me. Then that should be part of our ingredient. So the first is to obey instantly, to learn to tremble at his word. To obey even if it doesn't make sense. Obey, thirdly, even if it hurts. <laughs> a lot of times it might hurt your flesh because it might not be comfortable to obey. It isn't about comfort. We're supposed to comfort the afflicted with the same comfort that we received having been obedient. You want the comfort? It'll come after you obey. And then you have an anointing. And you can go comfort other people with the same comfort. But ultimately, that comfort still will require obedience on their part to turn to God. Or you're not comforting anything. Obey, number four, even if you do not see a benefit. (laughs) Wow, that one will work on you a little bit. Obey, if you're going to tremble at his word, obedience is going to be like second nature, but you're going to have to do it instantly. You're going to have to do it if it doesn't make sense. You're going to have to do it even if it hurts, but you're going to have to do it even if you do not see a benefit. And here's the thing that I want to see a transformation in a kingdom life church. I want to see this in the house groups. I want this cultivated. As a matter of fact, some of you ought to probably get, we ought to get this printed out. This is a definition of meekness. You know, humility and meekness is not your primary topic in the church. Did you notice that? All right. But listen to the definition of meekness. This is Bynes Expository Dictionary. Meekness does not consist of only an outward behavior or dealings with people. It's an inwrought grace of the soul, I would call that an attitude, an inwrought spiritual attitude, an inwrought grace of the soul exercised chiefly towards God, or an attitude of the heart. Oh, there it is. When we are meek, oh, maybe you ought to just write this part down and forget the rest. When we are meek, we accept all of God's dealing with us as good. We accept all of God's dealings as if they were good without disputing or resisting. (laughs) You ever argued with God? (laughs) Guess what? Attitude determines your performance. Who has the last word anyway in those arguments? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) You could probably save yourself some aggravation. (laughs) and go back to prompt obedience. To obey is better than sacrifice. Because people try to deal with God, they'll go. But God says in in Psalm 40, verse 6, I believe it is, I've given you a capacity to hear and obey. I don't want your sacrifices. When we're disobedient, we sometimes try to cover up by doing something nice to make ourselves not feel guilty. Well, since who made you Savior? Huh? You really think that works? But how about that for a definition of meekness? This is the one that God's going to look upon. They are who are meek and a contrite spirit. Well, what kind of people are these people? Oh, they accept God's dealings as good without disputing or resisting. How many people you know like that? Look at your neighbor and say, I don't think it's you. Now look to him and say, at least not yet. Soon and very soon. An inwrought grace of the soul 
exercised chiefly toward God as an attitude of the heart. When we are meek, we accept God's dealings with us as good without disputing or resisting. It is closely related to the word humility. No kidding. Huh? <laughs> we know all things are working together for the good to them that love God and are called according to his purpose. The fifth element. When you start to obey, the fifth element of obedience, to learning and cultivating, to tremble at his word, to be of a broken and a contrite spirit, one that honors God, that's a heart attitude. You'll learn to obey to completion. I once had a, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Bez came up to me one time and he was fascinated. He wanted to give me uh, my honorary doctorate based on life accomplishment with my first pastorate. All that I accomplished within a period that even the business experts said was impossible. But I just obeyed God and had a multi-million dollar facility with a gas well, oil wells on the property, flourished left and right. And he came and he says, but Dennis, just remember this. Even though he wanted to honor me with an honorary doctorate based on life accomplishment, he said, it's not how you start. It's how you finish. And I'll tell you, thus saith the Lord. We're going to get into that. How He's literally bringing to the surface now. I don't care. Don't look at your past successes. Consider those past successes rubbish compared to what I've called you to do in the days ahead. You've got to get motivated for your future. You've got to get off of your thing. We are to call, be called Hebrews. huh? And you know what Hebrews means? A river crosser. You've got to cross over. You just can't sit on this side of the river and say, oh, that's pretty good. You know, got leeks and onions here with these, you know. It's, it's okay. Food's not that bad. But God's basically saying, obey to completion. It's how you finish, not just how you start. Jesus said, it is finished. Paul said, I have finished my course. I fought a good fight. And God gave me by revelation through Leonard Evans when I had a supernatural experience where my car drove itself and I was merely, never had anything like that happen. It drove into a parking lot where he was at and I didn't even know he was there. I walked in in, a, in like a semi-trance, walked in and he said, do you know who I am? And I said, no. And he said, well, God told me I would see you again someday. And he said, my name is Leonard Evans. And he says, and basically I've got a word for you. So God took a car, supernaturally drove me to a church parking lot that I had never been to before, went down in the basement, met this man who was there with another minister, and he says, of Philippians 1.6, and this you will remember all the days of your life, for he who began a good work in you will finish it. He will complete it. He's going to complete it. You know that that's what that word means? Work out your salvation with fear and trust. Work out to what? Work out to its full completion. Obedience is wonderful, but obedience, it's not how you start, it's how you finish. Finish your course. Don't give up. Cross over. Don't just sit there and get comfortable and think you've got it together. God's basically saying the fifth element of cultivating a contrite, meek, God-honoring heart that trembles at his word. We're in that day and age where you're going to see a lot of trembling. You're going to see a lot of people totally touched by the Spirit of God. And I'm telling you what, God's not going to give up on you. Though a righteous man falls, you say, but I've blown it. Though a righteous man falls seven times, he gets back up. It's how you finish. It's not how many times you fall down, it's how many times you get back up and turn to him. Return to me, O my people, because afterwards they shall return to the Lord their God and to the Messiah their King, and they will come trembling and submissive to the Lord and his goodness in the end times. That's a word of the Lord for you, and I'm believing that we're all going to be like the Hebrews, that God hasn't given up on you, and when I fall, I will arise. That's what Micah 7, 8 says. Don't rejoice over me, enemy, though I fall and I'm going to get up. I will arise, and when I sit in darkness, the Lord will be a light to me. He will lighten my darkness. Now, here's what I want to get to. Talking about being a Hebrew. I'm telling you what, God is bringing together Jew and Gentile. God is bringing together man and woman to be an expression of, of the Godhead in a more complete fashion. 
for the, through, the, through the church. Here are the five warnings to the Hebrews. Hebrews, river crossers. Warning number one, drifting. How many of you ever drifted, gone through the motions? You know, when we travel church to church, I ministered to pastors, and a lot of them admitted that where they struggled in is they were going through the motions. Do you think, have you ever been going through the motions? You can do all the right stuff, right? And go through the motions. But with their lips, they praise me, but their heart is somewhere else. You didn't cross over. You quit. You drifted. And the warning in the Hebrews, there's five warnings to Hebrews. And this is the warning to the, to the people of God who refuse to cross over. Drifting. Therefore, we must give more earnest heed to the things that we have heard, lest we drift away. Thus saith the Lord, hear the word of the Lord, don't drift away. You need new passion to work out your salvation. Work out your salvation means to bring to completion, to see the purpose, the end of the charge that God has had for you individually. Doubting. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart as in the rebellion. Beware lest there be any of you with an evil heart of unbelief departing from God. We don't need to drift and we don't need to doubt. The warning again is, for you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers and someone teach you again the very first principles of the oracles of God. And you've come to need milk and not solid food. You're dull of hearing. You can hear the word over and over again and desensitize yourself to the gospel. Why do you think there are more miracles overseas than there are in many of the cases? I saw, I saw more gifting flow out of me in one meeting in Mexico, but the men that came to that meeting in Mexico were mountain men that walked miles, miles, wearied to go to that meeting to have pastors pour into them. Words of knowledge flowed, went to Russia, I had more words of knowledge in one meeting and more results in one meeting than I've seen in the church in America over it would take a lot of meetings to get the same result. There's something about a hungry heart and there's something about being satisfied in the wrong way. Your satisfaction needs to be in Him and truly if your satisfaction was in Him, the passion would grow on the inside in intensity. If you're satisfied any other way, it's flesh. Laziness. You know, they did a study of small groups. And you know that they found categories of sin amongst the men compared to the women? The men was lust, <laughs> sloth, go through the motions, lazy, no passion. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't know that one. Anger. Can you imagine men being angry? Lust. But isn't it interesting over a long period of time when they checked the women, it was different. Instead of lust, lazy, and angry, it was envy, Gluttony. What was the third one, Jennifer? Greed. And I said, wait a minute now. I'm going to get a little education from the world. I watch Hallmark. I know how this works. If the boyfriend and girlfriend break up, you see the man will throw something, break something, get angry. If the woman breaks up, she goes and she eats a half gallon of ice cream. Ah, there's the gluttony. <laughs> and, and envy and jealousy. I said, a man could wear the same blue shirt for a year on television and people would not notice. Very few. A woman. Ah. I noticed uh, she never wears the same thing. Guys don't talk like that, do they? But sin is sin, and just because you sin differently doesn't mean you don't. 
Hmm? You think there's a little bit of envy in women? Women dress for women more than they dress for men, don't they? Come on, raise your hand, women, if I'm right. Huh? You become dull of hearing by reason of time you should be teachers. I'm convinced Kingdom Life Church, what I call teachers are not just people that are biblically literate. What I call teachers are those that have had life transformation because then you're an adequate witness of discipleship. If you haven't done the 60-day challenge, if it's not changed your life in any way, you're just learning information, information, information. I'm telling you what, God has called us to be the point of a spear to penetrate the church generation with pioneering into areas that need to be restored. And it's Jew and Gentile, it's man and woman, and it's, and it's clearly going to be how to move through a work of the cross into a deeper dimension of God's maturing process. So let's take heed to these. God wants you to cross over into another realm of, the, of, of anointing. What's the other warning? Despising. For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remains no longer a sacrifice for sin, but certain fearful expectation of just judgment. He doesn't want us despising. And see to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. Defying. So there's drifting, doubting, dullness, despising, defying. All of these are Warnings in the book of Hebrews for people who stop short and get comfortable thinking, I know enough. I've arrived. Well, they, most people won't admit they've arrived, but you can live like you have without pursuing more. All right. Here's the characteristics. This was my mentor as a baby Christian. When God wouldn't let me go to a, baby uh, a Bible school and I was a baby, he basically cultivated in me, he says, this is what I want in you, Dennis. This is why you meet with me to honor me. That's principle number one, to honor me. Prompt obedience is the thing I want to cultivate in you because you've got to grow up out of these temper tantrums. You're just allowing the law of sin and death to increase its power. You give power to what you give attention to. But here's the four characteristics that I started with and I continue to evaluate myself with these four principles. One of them is this is the one that I will look upon who has a poor and a contrite spirit who trembles at my word. Number one, they are easily approachable spirit to spirit. Now there's a difference between easily approachable people and easily approachable spirit to spirit. We were called to know one another by the spirit, not according to the flesh. And what God trained in me from the very beginning was something my mentor basically taught me. A broken man doesn't miss a move in another man's spirit. And I knew that from the time I was a baby Christian. And I says, this is the kind of way of knowing people by the spirit, not according to the flesh. You, that, that's, you can see that by their actions and the things they say and do. But to know by the spirit requires a spiritual phenomena of knowing of knowing them by their flavor. Because then you can even speak a word in season to them that are weary. So cultivating that attitude that trembles at his word, you're gonna learn to be easily to contact spirit to spirit. And that means to know people by the spirit, not just judge them by the flesh. Judging and discerning are two different things. Secondly, and no, none of my other friends in ministry talked like this. A broken man doesn't miss a move in another man's spirit. And that's been my testimony from the time I got saved. Even though when I've heard great teachings on discernment, usually when they talk about discernment is I see or I hear. And I'm saying for me, the touching remains as a constant. Like a walk in the spirit is a constant moment by moment relationship is what needs pursued. It's beautiful to have flashes of insight, 
but life is about moment by moment relationship, not going from one flash of insight to the next flash of insight. And God can accomplish a lot with one flash of insight, can he? He can, he can turn people around, left and right. That's a beautiful thing. But the requirement is to work out my salvation to bring it to completion has to do with a moment by moment touching that reality and knowing people by the Spirit. <clears throat> I can remember the one time I had to stand alone when all these pastors were supporting an inner city uh, boys uh, mission and every church gave money and I shook the man's hand that was the head of it and I accidentally pulled it back. I didn't mean to do that. It was an overreaction to my discernment. I felt an uncleanness. Now, I'm not saying you pull your, that's not the right response. That was just in my, and I was embarrassed for that. And, but when I went to the Lord, I could not. I was the only church out of, I think, six of us, only church that did not give finances for that ministry. And I, had, I couldn't violate this. Right. Probably looked bad to people, but I couldn't violate that bad reaction. That was a no to me, and I don't override no for appearance sake. And a few months later, they found out he had taken all that money and went to, I, I don't know if it was Brazil, he went to a country where he was molesting the boys, to make a long story short and left the country, took the money and left the country. And so, that sounds like an indictment against the other pastors for not discerning, but that's not, if they didn't know, they didn't know. They, they did what they felt best. But all I know is I couldn't override it, and then later I was glad I didn't override it. It was the opposite of empty your wallet. Do you see, obedience requires an intimate, Moment by moment relationship with God. It's not about your head. It's not about what you understand. It's not about whether it hurts. It's not about whether you like it or not. Here's the other thing that God is looking for. And this is why our small groups are so important. The third characteristic. The first is that you are approachable spirit to spirit. The second is that you don't miss a move in another person's spirit. You get to know them by the spirit. The third one is sitting in a, a local church. Your spirit has the capacity to touch the other people in the spirit. That means you've matured to the point that you're ready for corporate life. It's not a crowd. Most Christians, it's a crowd. But when you realize that you not only listen to the preacher, but that this is your family. I don't know everybody in my family, but this is my family. You have matured to the point of being ready for corporate life. Everyone, no matter how much Bible they know, no matter how long they're in the church, are not necessarily ready for corporate life. They're lone rangers even with radically good church attendance, you can still have walls and never really, really touch the heart of a congregation and a family. God says, I need, that's why we used to have people stand before we did the worship and say, okay, now we're going to worship God, but let's do this. Open your heart to the person to your left and right. We want Jesus to sing through our corporate expression, but we need to break down the wall of hostility. And you say, well, Dad, I have no hostile wall. Closed off is the same as a wall. The only legitimate wall in the kingdom of God is peace. And if you've got peace with one another, eventually you're going to make a connection and know that this is part of who I am. This, has got, this is my tribe. This is my DNA. Yes, it's a local church, and there are a lot of local churches. And I know people come and go, too, which only proves my fact. <laughs> that a lot of times you don't know where it is. And there are, there's legitimate reasons for going to different churches. And if this one, if you don't get saved, filled with the Holy Spirit, you shouldn't go somewhere else. <laughs> we'll get you saved. We'll get you filled with the Holy Spirit. All right? Ready for corporate life. We're going to be Hebrew river crossers. Don't stop and say, I do everything right except that part about connection. 
That is an indication of maturity when you belong to something bigger than you. When you can make a heart connection horizontally, not just vertically. I've seen over the years people that were committed to Dennis and Jennifer, but they, were, they never had, they had no concern whatsoever for anybody else in the room. That's not maturity. That's the pride of sophistication. How many have ever heard that? Pride of, there's the pride of superiority. There's the pride of inferiority. The pride of sophistication is who you hang with, name droppers. I remember having one of the most demonic ladies I ever met went, hi, I, go, I went to Rod Parsley's church. <laughs> I was supposed to be impressed, but she was so loaded down with demonic activity, it kind of got me sidetracked onto her spiritual condition. The name dropping didn't really impress me. And I'll bet you Rod didn't know her. <laughs> Why aren't you in Rod's church now? <laughs> and here's the fourth element that I work on this to this day, to have the fear and trembling and have a meek spirit before the Lord, to be a God-honoring person. The last one is, and I saw it in my first church and I knew it happened. Now they weren't sleeping, but I saw people that would listen to my sermons that would drink in the anointing on the sermon more than the content. People who have a humble and a meek and a teachable spirit, a God-honoring spirit, draw on the anointing and they are open to the spirit that's on the teaching, not just the information of the teaching. It'll keep you safe with prophetic words too. Because you can I've heard prophetic words that had anger on them. I don't receive the anger part. Easily edified. Can we put the, the chart up on the wall, the first one? Do you see that through the work of the cross, Jesus provided absolutely everything we need through the work of the cross? I want my people to fall in love with the work of the cross. What did we say? We fight. We fight by yielding. We live by dying. Dying is to simply take up your cross and follow after him. All of those things were provided. He taught us how to forgive. He taught us that it's no longer I that live, but Christ that lives within me. The enthroned life. This is coming. Here's what's coming in the days ahead. Thus saith the Lord. I want you to hear this. Because here's the scripture that you're going to see manifested in your lifetime. When the glory comes, it's going to be, Who is this that comes out of the wilderness like smoke? Like pillars of smoke, perfumed with myrrh and frankincense, with all the fragrant powders of the merchant. That's Song of Solomon, chapter 3, verse 6. She, as an overcoming representative of God's elect, say, That's me comes from Egypt out of the wilderness like persons with the unshakable power of the Spirit, perfumed with the sweet death and fragrant resurrection of Christ, with all the fragrant riches of Jesus as a merchant. The Lord needs the overcoming ones, those who are perfumed and permeated with the fragrance of Christ's riches. You know that, that anointing oil had both a fragrance of myrrh, oh, it's for death, Frankincense for resurrection. I'll tell you what, we're, we're to be a fragrance of life that passed through death yet lives in resurrection power. An enthroned life. We're going to be the pillar of fire by day and night. We're going to see, we're going to see Jacob's ladder. We're going to see on earth as it is in heaven. The enthroned life is going to be a level of, let me see the second, um, the second slide. I believe that when the glory comes, there's going to be a genuine work of the cross. People are going to humble themselves and come to the power of God, and we're going to see the glory, the glory come. And it's going to be an enthroned life. It's going to be people that are so thoroughly connected through, through a work of the cross and the power of God that they're going to be like the pillar of fire and the cloud by day. 
It's going to be Jacob's ladder. It's going to be like the angels ascending and descending on the Son of God. It's going to be on earth as it is in heaven. It's going to be the enthroned life. These are the overcomers. They're going to come out of the wilderness like smoke. Who is this that comes out of the wilderness like smoke? How about Jesus when he was tempted in the wilderness? When he came out, what did he say? The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, and he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to set the captives free. The, right? He came out of the wilderness like smoke, like smoke and fire that ascended from heaven to earth, on earth as it is in heaven. All right? So there's where I see the forgiven life, unfortunately, we pioneered and we spearheaded to the body of Christ the baby stage of teaching people how to forgive. Do you realize that? That most of the body of Christ, Christians, biblically literate people do not know how to forgive instantly. They still think it's a hard, long, difficult process. It might take months or years to forgive somebody. What a travesty when that's been provided through us. We've got to learn how to walk in the light as he is in the light, that we have fellowship one with another. And there's no walls. The roof is off and our relationship is with God. Our walls are down and we have relationship one with another. Fellowship, true fellowship is horizontal as well as with God. The replaced life, we've seen people come into this. I came into this, Jason came into this, and we saw other people come into this. But here's what happened. In that replaced life, suddenly, let, let's look at the progression though. Here's, here's where we're at. You have some new believers in the house group. Maybe you're a new believer. Maybe you've been around a long time. But from the forgiven life through the work of the cross, before, between forgiven life and the replaced life, it goes in stages like this. Test yourself. See if you're growing in the grace and the knowledge of God. You start out by learning how to forgive properly. <clears throat> you start learning that as you learn to forgive spontaneously and obediently, you find out the periods are growing farther apart. You're starting to walk in a forgiveness lifestyle to where it is kind of matter of fact. It's not that difficult, obscure thing that you got to cry and complain about. So you see there's progression. But the replaced life, something beautiful happens. Instead of being a proficient forgiver. Do you know you could be a victim and a proficient forgiver? Huh? That's not God's best for you. So you learn how to release forgiveness, but on the other hand, everybody's picking on me all the time. I got to forgive all day long. Poor me. How about learning to forgive to such a degree that you beat them to the punch and you begin to move? You begin to move in the love of God and you start releasing from that belly the love of God and you start blasting them. Huh? Then you're no longer a victim. You're a victor, and you're overcoming. You're overcoming with the love of God. And so you're moving progressively, and you say, oh, and then we've had people do this. We have people that got this, got miraculous healings, and then moved on because they thought they arrived. Oh, we learned that Dennis and Jennifer thing, that for forgiveness thing. That is only the baby basics to what we're teaching. But it just happened that the church is so poor at it that it got emphasized. We're going to teach abiding in John 15 and practicing the presence of God 24-7. That's the thrust. Learning to abide in the Spirit, a walk in the Spirit, a moment-by-moment -moment relationship. But the church is so poor at forgiveness, that has, to be, that has to be a pioneered effort to break through. Then, break through that after you are a proficient forgiver, Learn how not to be a victim and go militantly as a lover. And start really, do you know that when you forgive somebody and you release it from your belly and you feel the pain go? Did you ever pay attention to what's after that? That's the love of God. That's the love of God flowing out. Well, why not start there? Why not start releasing love to people? Start, when you pray for them, pay attention that, you, that you're at the place of peace. Peace precedes your perception and the love that flows out. Out of my belly flows. <clears throat> now, the replaced life. By the way, in the replaced life, all of a sudden the emphasis changes. How many want to enter into that work of the cross? 
to where I'm, 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 God, it's no longer I that live, but you living through me. For it is God who is at work to will and to perform. I want to work out my salvation to the point where it's God who is working through me and not my good ideas. In order to do that, if that happens, <coughs> here's the first thing you're going to find out. All of a sudden, instead of having this forgiveness down pat, you will deal, and it's with temptation. Temptation is tailor-made for you. What do we say about meekness? I'm going to I'm going to treat all of this without disputing or arguing with God. Why am I always being tempted in the same way? Uh, duh. <laughs> Why are you always being tempted in the same way? Why is it always that same old same old? Duh. There you go. But in the in the replaced life, it's a work of the cross to where you spend most of your time. Not that you can't sin and don't need to ask for forgiveness, because that happens, that'll happen through your whole Christian life. But you spend most of the time learning how to properly resist temptation. You will feel it, but you won't own it. Feeling it or being tempted is not sin. Say that back because we're not going to get to the replaced life. Many of you are not going to get to the replaced life if you still are, live in condemnation when you blow it. How many still, don't, don't raise your hand. I don't want to. <laughs> Condemnation is of the devil. God has made a provision through the blood of Jesus Christ and the work of the cross to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Prompt obedience would be prompt repentance, prompt forgiveness. But if you beat yourself, you're back in the law. You need to cross over and get back in the spirit. But in the replaced life, you spend most of your day recognizing temptation and not yielding to I, I'm not going there. I'm not going there. I'm not going there. Ah, men, it'll be lust, anger, and laziness. <laughs> Ladies, envy, gluttony, greed. Come on, I watch Hallmark. I know that that works. Those patterns are probably real. <laughs> I've seen it happen. What do they do? I got to marry a rich guy. I've even had people say, they married a lawyer, but then the lawyer was called to ministry. And I've had, them, I've had them come to me for counseling. They wanted divorced. I didn't marry a minister. I married a lawyer. That's greed, honey. That's just plain greed. I married a lawyer. I didn't marry a pastor. It didn't sound like you married a man. It sounded like you married money title, something. Huh? Can you see the categories of the sin, of the seven deadly sins? We, we do them all, but I just thought it was interesting over a long period of time, the women's group and the men's group sin differently. <laughs> but sin is sin, right? I've never seen a man go, how come I don't have a shirt like that? Wonder where they got that shirt. I should have that shirt. And I, don't, and I don't see a man go home and say, my girlfriend broke up with me. I'm going to eat a half a gallon of ice cream. I'm going to pick it up. Right? But if we love their differences, we can minister more effectively to them, can't we? We understand them. That replaced life is an area to where you learn how to live on that second level with temptation. No longer babes stuck in forgiveness and struggling with your Christian walk and struggling with condemnation. Such a, what a waste of time. Get up. It's not how you've fallen down. Get up, repent, receive forgiveness, get cleansed by the blood of Jesus. And God's got a plan for you. And it's not how many times you've fallen down. It's a question of how you finish. Did you get back up? Isn't that true? But afterwards, they're going to return to the Lord their God and to the Messiah their King, and they're going to come trembling and submissive to the Lord and His goodness in the end times. These are those end times. And I believe in that we're going to raise up a people who are going to know how to tremble at His word. We're going to know 
I actually did cover everything I wanted to cover. You got an overload today, but Jennifer's preached so many times in a row, I had to get it all in one. <laughs> but I strongly suggest that you go over this message slowly, because everything that I preached, God took me to the school of the Spirit and went slow with me on all of those points. It's not just point one, two, three, four, five. I'm giving you out of my own life the school of the Spirit, and it needs to be learned and acquired and appropriated by the power of the Spirit. How many are ready for a deeper work of the cross? You're not afraid of the cross of Jesus. Let's pray for that replaced life. Some of you have gotten proficient in forgiveness, and we've seen it when we travel, remember? They'll just move on. Oh, I got everything Jen Dennis and Jennifer teach. They, they teach that forgiveness thing. And I, I got that now. Now I'm going to graduate. Most of them didn't graduate. Most of them finally got some relief. But as far as I'm concerned, they were still, I speak to you little children because your sins are forgiven. I speak to you young men because you've overcome the wicked one. I want to get to that second level to where you are strong in the Lord and you overcome the wicked one by learning to deal with temptation and not just be a proficient forgiver, repenter. <laughs> I want you proficient, and you'll always need to forgive. Anyone that says that they don't sin anymore is a liar, and the truth's not in them. But habitually, spend most of your time, your consciousness most of the time is on thoroughly not giving in to temptation. How many are, I'm going to pray that right now. I want you to stand up if you really want that. You really want a deeper work of the cross. And I'm going to pray for an impartation right now. It happened to Jason first and then to me. And I'll tell you what, it's, it's, it's a life of dealing with temptation. And by the way, the temptation is tailor-made for you, but I don't fight or resist the, uh, against God. I welcome it, knowing that every time I resist, I'm getting stronger and growing in the in the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, and I'm being set free from the law of sin and death. So, Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, we want to make Galatians 2.20 a reality in my life. Here I am, God, and I'm offering my, my body here that it is no longer I. I don't even, I need the experience of this more than the understanding, but I'm willing to offer myself and yield my heart to a deeper work of the cross of Jesus Christ. Yes, I've gotten proficient in learning how to forgive and not live in condemnation, but God, I want to move to the place to where I can resist temptation more effectively because it is God who is at work in me to will and to perform. I'm, you said to bring to completion, to work out my salvation. Well, this is a day I'm giving you notice. Have my heart, God. I want to honor you. I want to become sensitive to you because the time and the season that we're living in is going to require it in the days ahead for a deeper, richer work of the cross in my heart and in my life today. I don't mean, I mean business here. This is not just something casual. This is something to where where I'm believing and receiving right now that all things are possible with God, only believe. I'm opening up my heart to a deeper work of the cross in my life, that you who began a good work are continuing it. And I'm saying, I want to graduate today. I want to graduate by dying to my flesh life, my self life, my selfishness that's in me. I'm not just talking about sin, I'm talking about self. I want my self. Uh, let's pray a selfers prayer. Lord Jesus, I am tired of living the Christian life in my own strength. I'm a selfer. And I receive forgiveness for trying to live the Christian life in my own strength. Rise up in me and rule so that it is no longer I that live but Christ that lives in me to will and to do according to his good pleasure. I release all resistance, all arguments against spontaneous obedience to you. And if you really mean that in your heart, then we just pray right now for a 
replaced life to where all of a sudden it's going to be God seeing, his, seeing with his eyes through you and giving you the opportunity to obey. He will be the prompting. He will be the motivator. And I just believe there's a trembling coming right now in Jesus' name. Tremble in our hearts, whether it's an outward trembling or an internal, but tremble in your hearts. Circumcise the tablet of my heart for a greater and newer sensitivity to the Spirit. For I want to be part of what you're doing in the days ahead. For the spear thrust is pioneered through and we've broken through the veil. And now there is a beginning, the beginning of the trembling, a beginning of the returning. But God says, I am opening now to a suddenly, a move of the deep work of the cross in my life to prepare my heart for the days ahead, for I'm going to be a God-honoring individual. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit forgive123.com. Did you know that we have an online school available? Hi, I'm Pastor Jason Clark. We invite you to join our international community of almost a thousand students currently enrolled in a school like no other. Team Embassy equips believers to live in the spirit by giving them the how-to tools for wholeness, intimacy with God, and living the abundant life Jesus promised us. You will learn how to heal emotional pain quickly and completely. You'll discover amazing keys to tap into the fruit of the Spirit and practice the presence of God as a lifestyle. Exciting courses available include the 60-day challenge, self-deliverance, healing rejection, codependency, intimate prayer, the functions of the human spirit, and many, many more. It's formatted so that you could take it with you on all your mobile devices. Sign up today at training.teamembassy.com. Be transformed. Become all God created you to be. You will never be the same.